All right, are we ready to rock and roll this morning? We're just going to dig in. Um, we, uh, if you're new, the last, I don't know, about two months I think now, we have been going through this series called Love, God, and Sex. I don't know if I got the word, it's God, Love, and Sex. There you go. Um, we're going through the Song of Songs. And if you are new to the church, um, Song of Songs is in the Old Testament. And uh, we've made this, I think, pretty clear the last two months. It is a collection of love poems. And it's not just any collection of love poems. They are basically categorized as Jewish erotic poetry. And so what we've been doing is there's, there's three main characters, but really two. There's a young female lover and a young male lover. And as we've been marching through, we, we've kind of looked at this couple and, and look at their, their interactions, the different dynamics in their relationship. Um, they're full of passion sexual passion um, a lot of the time, Um, but then there's also obstacles and barriers and disappointments and frustrations that are also very much painted in these love poems. And up until this point, we've we've just been looking at their relationship. Um, The the book just describes it for us um, as we kind of get a sneak peek at it. And now this morning, and then next Sunday, next Sunday we conclude this series, um, we're going to be taking a step back, and now at this point, kind of getting an an aerial view of not just their relationship, not just this book, um, but kind of its place in the story of the scriptures, Uh, meaning we're going to be looking at love in general. And I think what we're going to see this morning, we're in the last chapter of Song of Songs, we'll be in chapter 8, it's not a long book, is this young female lover, for the first time ever in these poems, she takes kind of an aerial view, and she begins to describe of what is love. And I automatically think of, song, of the song, you know, what is love? Um, but that, that's what she does here, is what is love? And, and what's going to happen, and this is so, so important to get, is that as she steps back and she begins to talk about love in general, I think the role of it is for us to realize, to kind of lift our head and see that this young Jewish relationship, it's about so much more than just them. There's a bigger a deeper, a larger love story that they are painting in these poems. And so now she's going to kind of cause us to ask, okay, what, what are the bigger questions going on here? What's this bigger love story that she's describing? And, and basically my point this morning is going to be this. Love and sex and romance and everything in there is actually made to point us to a far bigger understanding of love with the divine. So here's what I want you to do. Turn with me, chapter 8, Song of Songs. Um, Song of Songs is right before the, the prophet Isaiah and after Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament. We're looking at two verses, chapter 8, verses 6 through 7. And all scholars are in agreement that chapter 8, verses 6 through 7, is, is the climax of these poems. So this is where the book reaches its height. Um, and, and most even say that verses 6 through 7 are the theme of Song of Songs. So the whole time, these poems are ushering us to verse 6. And... Um, we're digging right in this morning, so if you're new, there's going to be no like funny jokes this morning, stories, side comments, so you guys don't get me off topic, right? Because we got a lot we got to cruise through. And so I need you to hang with me for like 20 minutes. I'm going to nerd out you, and I want to develop a biblical theology of love, a biblical theology of marriage, starting with Song of Songs, but expanding out. And so hang with me. Um, Here's here's my promise to you this morning, 
if you can grasp a larger understanding of love and marriage in the Bible, I think you will leave here this morning with an entirely enhanced view of what marriage is for. Basically looking at what is the point, what is the meaning of marriage. So here we go, chapter 8, verses 6 through 7. Um, The young female lover, she's the one talking here, and here's what she proclaims. Place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. And here, here she goes. For love is as strong as death. It's jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like a blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Many waters cannot quench love, rivers cannot sweep it away. If one were to give all the wealth of one's house for love, it would be utterly scorned. You cannot buy love. And so this young female right away here, at kind of uh, the, the climax of these poems, she begins to give this philosophy of love, if you will. And she makes all these metaphors that she compares love to. And when we first read this, it kind of feels like, all right, this is, you know, your typical Romeo and Juliet kind of, you know, she's at her height and, you know, man, love, it's stronger than death and waters can't quench it and she's excited and so she gives these very poetic words. And all of that is true, but I think there's so much more going on here than just poetic exaggeration. This might be a bummer, but on a human level, at least for me, when I read these words, especially the, for love is as strong as death, um, if I take that literally, that doesn't seem to be true. In a lot of ways, death, like, hangs over this whole book. Death hangs over this chapter. I mean, life as we know it, at least how I know it, I think everyone else would would agree with this. I mean, doesn't it seem like death has the last word? Everyone dies. Haven't, other than Jesus, haven't met someone um, who has kind of conquered death. And so she says here, love is stronger than death. And it's just kind of like, That seems like pie in the sky, poetic romance, but let's get real and practical. And then scholars also point out that just a couple verses later, um, this collection of love poems, it ends very abruptly in verses 13 through 14. So just six, seven verses later, it it just ends. Like, Like there's no, oh, and they lived happily ever after. It just ends, and actually the way it ends, if you read it, is is they're dialoguing between each other, and they want to be with each other physically, like they want to be together. They're begging for more. They're not satisfied. They're always longing for more, and so it seems as like in chapter 8, there's this thing inside of us as we read this that there's something much larger going on here. Because death seems stronger than love, yet she's saying, no, love is stronger than death. And I'm like, okay, fine, metaphorically maybe, but what about actually? And this brings us to the point that I want to wrestle with now. And the reason why I need to nerd out with you is that you probably didn't wake up this morning wanting to learn some Hebrew and some ancient Near East Ugaritic mythology, because that's what you're about ready to step into. So, in our English translations of our Bible, um, we miss this. But this text, written thousands of years ago, was, was originally written in Hebrew. And when we look at the Hebrew of this, it changes the game. Because what she's doing is she takes four metaphors, death, the grave, fire, and water, and she compares love to those. 
But what many of us don't know, what I didn't know until this past week, was that all four of those metaphors are personifications of false gods in the ancient world. They're Ugaritic gods, Ugaritic mythology. We're going to put up a, a, a slide here on the screen. So check this out. This is cool. And this is why I need you to nerd out with me for a little bit. Because this is what's going on here. She takes four false gods in the ancient Near East culture. And they were all personified as like the god of death. And so you have Mot. He's, he's a part of, of, they had tons of gods back then. Every piece of nature was um, a god. Mot was the god of death. Mott was considered the god of death. And so she says, love is as strong as death. Then she brings up the grave. Um, the grave in the ancient world was a personification for what's called Sheol. You'll read this in the Psalms, and it stands for the netherworld. Kind of think about like all dark spirits or where people go when they die. And Mott also oversaw Sheol, the netherworld. She moves on. She brings up fire. She says, love is burning like a flame. Well, there was an ancient god that was known to bring plagues and fire, and that was Reshef, an allusion to Reshef. And then she makes one more allusion. She brings up waters and, and streams, and she says, even water can't quench this love. Even a, a river or stream can't wash it away. And that also in Hebrew is referencing yam. Now, all these gods are foreign to us. We didn't live in the ancient world. We're 3,000 years later. Um, we are what's called monotheists. We only believe in one God. Here's what's fascinating, though. This is a young Jewish couple. They only believed in one God, of course, just like we do. But everyone around them believed in all of these gods. And here's what she's doing. When she brings up love, she's saying that this is a huge battle. This is a divine conversation. Love is at the very core of the universe, as we're going to see. And she's saying, there's all these other gods who are battling against love. And she says, love is better than death. Love can kill Mot. Love can kill Reshef. Love can kill Yam. Sheol's got nothing on love. You, you see what she's doing? She's elevating love, and she's saying, love is better than all these other surrounding false gods. They have nothing on love. And we're left wondering, okay, well, A, I'm just going to assume all that was probably brand new for us. Probably never heard that before. I didn't until this past week in my research. And so we're clued in, okay, wow, this is, this is a bigger discussion here than just this Jewish relationship. This is kind of a divine conversation. Well, the question then becomes, okay, well, who's the God of love? Because it's all these other false gods that stand for the rivers, the streams, Sheol, the grave, death. What about love? Who's the God of love? This as, as any good surfer would say, this is gnarly. Check this out. Verse 6. You notice that she says, love is burning like a blazing fire. It's hot. It's all-consuming. And, and she says, actually, these flames are so hot that she uses an adjective to describe this fire. If you love grammar, you're going to love this. The adjective that she uses in Hebrew to describe this fire has a very interesting suffix attached to it that happens to end with three letters. 
which are Y, A, H. We'll put up this up on the screen. What are the first three letters of the Hebrew God? What's the name of the Hebrew God? Hint, it's up on the screen. Yahweh. So if you've heard Yahweh mentioned before in church, now you know, oh, that's like the Hebrew name for God. Yes, that that is our God's personal name in Hebrew, Yahweh. You'll notice that the first three letters of Yahweh are Y-A-H. What are the three letters that she tacks on to describe this burning, consuming, hot fire? Y-A-H. If you have one of these Bibles, if, in case you think I'm like, Mark, did you like smoke something this weekend? Or like, what's going on, dude? I didn't, <clears throat> just to clarify that. <laughs> um, if, you, if you use one of these Bibles, you'll actually see a footnote next to this phrase. And if you break it down to the bottom, I, sa- I believe it says the letter B. And it gives you another possible translation. Um, the ESV and many other translations disagree with the NIV of how to translate this. Some scholars say it should be translated this way, and we'll put this up on the screen. Its flashes are flashes of fire. Bless you. You're welcome. It's the very flame of the Lord. So, perhaps, this young girl madly in love, is she poetically, metaphorically, hinting to us, hey, this whole thing about love is actually a far bigger discussion, and at the center of it is our God of love. And he's a God of love who is absolutely burning with passion for love. Love is who he's at in his being. And so Yahweh, the God of Israel, the God of Christians today, is a God filled with flaming, hot, Love for you and I. And what does she say about this fire? What what does she say about these flames? Waters can't quench it. Rivers can't sweep it away. Love is stronger than death. You can't buy it. And it's Yahweh who is this God. See, love is at the core of our universe. Love is what makes this world go round. Love created this world. Love created you. Love is what you yearn and ache for and long for and want in this world, just like this young couple. And it's because you and I are made in the image of God who is love himself. And now, if you're tracking with me, You begin to to take a step back and you look at this aerial view of of these love poems and you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. So this whole conversation about romance and sex and love and frustrations and and disappointments and, and missing each other and everything in between is actually a whole book that's supposed to lift our eyes to Yahweh, the God of love. See, this whole book, there's something divine that's been happening. Their relationship is supposed to point us to our relationship with God. You see that? Human love, human sexuality is made to point you to divine love. Now, If some of you disagree with everything that I just said, that's okay. Um, Let me let me let me pull the curtain back a little bit further, and I want to show you some other passages in the scriptures 
that I think get at the same picture, the same notion that a romantic human love relationship, marriage, is actually made to be a picture of God's love for you. So all throughout the Bible, in the Old Testament, and that's where I'm going to take us, um, God's relationship to humankind is likened to a marriage. And you see this all over the place once you see it. And so Yahweh, God is seen as a husband, and his people, in the Old Testament, that's Israel, are seen as his wife. And so we go from human relationship to divine relationship, husband and wife, God as husband, us, um, his people as a wife. So let me just take you to a couple passages. I just want to walk you through this so that you can see this is in the scriptures. This is not just a Pastor Mark thing. Um, And I also think we skip over this too easily. I don't think we understand the the radicalness (laughs) of this metaphor. So don't worry about turning there. We'll put it up on the screen. First one, Jeremiah 2.2. We read this, go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says. So this is God speaking through the prophet. I remember the devotion of your youth, how as a bride you loved me and followed me through the wilderness, through a land not sown. So God right there calls his people, Israel, a bride. All right, next one, Isaiah 54, 6 through 7. Um, This is about as explicit and black and white as you can get. For your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. The Lord will call you back, and check this out, as if you were a wife deserted and distressed in spirit. A wife who married young, only to be rejected, says your God. For a brief moment I abandoned you. But with deep compassion, I will bring you back. Next one. Hosea 2, 16, 19 through, 19 through 20. By the way, if you've never read Hosea, it's a crazy book to read for multiple reasons. Uh, but here, here's what we read there. In that day, declares the Lord, here it is, you will call me my husband. You no longer call me my master. I will betroth you, engage you, to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice and love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness and you will acknowledge the Lord. So all throughout the Old Testament, there are allusions and metaphors directly, explicitly that Yahweh is husband and his people are wife, that, that he's using human, human language to say, hey, you're actually in like a divine romance. God is our husband we are his, his bride. All of this to say, any Jewish reader, when they read Song of Songs, their mind automatically goes to these verses. And so they read these love poems and they're looking at, at the human relationship and absolutely every, all that's true. But they said, no, there's something behind it that it's pointing to. This carries over to the New Testament. Go to all the way to the end of your Bible, the book of Revelation. Um, the book of Revelation is kind of a sneak peek in some of its parts into the future. And so there are a couple of visions given of what things will look like when Jesus comes back to restore and redeem this earth. Here are two visions that we get. Revelation 19, 6 through 9. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude like the roar of rushing waters and the loud pearls of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. And here it is, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. And then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. Two chapters later, Revelation 21, verses 1 through 2, this is one of my favorite 
verses in the Bible. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Here's the freebie. Do you know what that verse means there by there's no longer any sea? Is God saying there's going to be no ocean? New heavens? I hope not. I love the ocean. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying in the ancient world, the sea represented the gods of chaos. Yam. There's no more chaos in the new heavens and the new earth. Why? I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Here it is, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. You and I are the bride, beautifully dressed for Yahweh, our husband. So the Bible, from beginning to end, literally, is one giant love story between God and us, his people. More than any other human relationship, marriage reflects the divine human relationship. So sex is never just about sex. Marriage is never just about marriage. A Song of Songs scholar says this, Marriage is designed by God to give us language and experiences that are not merely satisfying and delightful in themselves, but out of which we learn to understand our relationship with God more fully. This is why whenever we talk about marriage, and this is why we're ending our series this way the next two weeks, whenever you talk about marriage, whenever you talk about sexuality, you have to, it just naturally end up talking about God. So marriage doesn't make sense. I actually would say marriage doesn't even really work. And I think a a 50% divorce rate proves that in America if you leave God out. And so when we talk about sexuality, when we talk about romance, it just, we end up talking about the divine. Because you can't separate them. It's like a marriage, they go together. And let me say this. We can't separate our sexuality from our spirituality because our sexuality points to our spirituality. Let me say it one more time. We can't separate our sexuality from our spirituality because our sexuality points towards our spirituality. Just as a wife and husband are one, and that's what the scriptures say in Genesis, right? They'll leave their parents, and they become one flesh, echad in Hebrew. That's how we are with God, spiritually speaking. We become one with him. There's a union. Now. That was your 20 minutes of nerding out. Love it. All right, I got one fan. Everyone else is like, dude, this guy's boring. (laughs) Here's where I'm taking this to. This, brothers and sisters, is the secret to marriage. This is the secret to marriage. What do I mean? Um, one last passage we're going to look at. Ephesians 5. The Apostle Paul, brilliant dude, church planter, used to be against Jesus. His life is converted. It changes everything. He writes what's considered probably the most epic chapter on marriage in the whole Bible in Ephesians 5. And the, here's the crazy thing that Paul does. And I, I just think we're used to this passage. I think we're numb to it, so we don't understand the jar of it. But Paul is just talking about wife and husband, a human marriage relationship. And towards the end, it's almost like he accidentally just kind of, oops, actually, guys, I'm not talking about a human relationship. I'm actually talking about Christ and the church. It actually should startle us. But I think you hear, you hear this so much that it doesn't. Verse 24, let's read a little bit of it. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should, yeah, should submit to their husbands in everything. Um, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Go down to verse 31. Paul here quotes out of Genesis. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh when they have sex. That's what he's getting at. Do you see what he says here next, verse 3 through? This is a profound mystery. 
but I'm talking about Christ in the church. Oh, by the way, however, each one of you should also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Do you, do you get, he says, this is a profound mystery. But he's saying, this is the secret. Let, let, me, let me cue you guys into something that's been the divine blueprint all along. And the secret is this. Marriage is actually about Jesus and the church. Marriage isn't about marriage. Marriage is about pointing you to the lover of your soul. See, marriage, marriage is actually about the gospel. If you want to understand what marriage is, you need to have a really good grasp of the good news of Jesus. Marriage is never about marriage. Sex is never about sex. Now, is marriage and sex awesome? Hallelujah, amen. I think, that, I think I've made that pretty evident in this series. Preach. Come on, Elena. Here we go. Now, I, I got Elena and Tom right here that are tracking me, and that's about it. I love you too. So sex is awesome, it's beautiful, it's powerful, it's wonderful, it's amazing, and it's God created, right? That's what we've looked at kind of these last seven or eight weeks or however long it's been. And at minimum, Song of Songs says that. And I'm of the opinion that Song of Songs is absolutely Jewish erotic poetry. But it's not just that. It alludes to something so much more. And we know in our bones, we want more, we need more love, we want more love, we ache for it, we yearn for it, we're not ultimately satisfied. We always want more. And so Song of Songs 8, 6 through 7, and this girl, she says, love is as strong as death. And if we're honest, we're like, ah, but doesn't death win? I mean, everyone's going to die, so how can you say this, but what if? She's speaking from the divine perspective. And the whole point of marriage and sex is to point you to the ultimate lover, God himself, the God of love whose love is unconditional, unchanging, always forgiving, always faithful, always gentle, always gracious, always protective. And ultimately, it's only God's love displayed through Jesus on the cross that answers this young girl's declaration that love is as strong as death. See, ultimately, I think her cry is real. I think her cry is true, and love is stronger than death, and we find that out in Romans 8, 38 through 39. Paul says, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. So whatever you can think of, plug it in. will be able to separate you and I from the love of God that is seen in Jesus Christ our Lord. That's Song of Songs 8, 6 through 7. She says, love is as strong as death. Waters can't quench it. Rivers can't put it away. It's going to be burning hot. Nothing can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ seen on the cross. This is the best news that we could hear, whether you are single or married, female or male. And here's why this is good news. When you understand, and not just understand cognitively, but emotionally, that Jesus, God himself, is the ultimate lover of your soul, you will never put the burden, if you have a spouse, of them being your God. If you're married, you know deep in your bones, I don't care how magical or enchanting you say your marriage is, and you, you, you always meet those people who are like, oh, we just love each other. We, we never have any issues. You're like, dude, shut up. That's not true. <laughs> oh, there's an amen. Man, that's when I get an amen. <laughs> <laughs> I 
We know that in our bones if, if you've been married, that your spouse can never be your everything. And can I just say this? They're not supposed to be. But we put that expectation on them emotionally and spiritually. And then it all goes downhill from there. You know that when, one of the most fascinating things to me about a wedding, of course, I look at this from a pastoral perspective. You know when a couple stands up there, <laughs> when, and when you say I do to one another, it's a horrible situation in that you're taking one sinner, you're taking another sinner, and you're putting them together. We, have, we usually use bad math. We think that one plus one equals one. No, no, no. One sinner plus another sinner equals double the amount of sin together. <laughs> but if you know how much Jesus passionately loves you, and you're able to rest in that and to be secure in that, you will no longer put that expectation on your spouse to be your everything, which is impossible for any human being to, to do. Do you know that you can actually love your spouse the most when you grasp how much God loves you? The love of God is so freeing because it frees you from having to find your identity in another human being. And when you get to that point, then you're just going to have an awesome marriage. Tim Keller, um, in his fantastic book, The Meaning of Marriage, in my mind, this is the best book out on marriage. So if you want a book on it, go read it. Tim Keller, he says this, marriage, therefore, is penultimate. It points us to the real marriage that our souls need and the real family that our hearts were made for. Married couples will do a bad job of conducting their marriage if they don't see this penultimate status. Even the best marriage cannot by itself fill the void in our souls left by God. Without a deeply fulfilling love relationship with Christ now and hope and a perfect love relationship with Him in the future, Married Christians will put too much pressure on their marriage to fulfill them. And that will always create pathology or disease in their lives. And now we're going to shift to singles. But singles, they also must see the penultimate status of marriage. If single Christians don't develop a deeply fulfilling love relationship with Jesus, they will put too much pressure on their dream of marriage. And that will create pathology in their lives as well. However, if singles learn to rest in and rejoice in their marriage to Christ, that means that they'll be able to handle single life without a devastating sense of being unfulfilled and unformed. The lie and the temptation of our culture is to find complete emotional and spiritual fulfillment in your perfect soulmate. Let me crush that for you and say that human beings were never meant to be your everything. What if God ordained marriage before the beginning of time to actually point and guide you to his ultimate love? See, romance, love, and sex, they are wildly awesome, beautiful, powerful, and God created. But they're ultimately a sign that points to the real marriage between God and his people. See, all the greatness of human love and sexuality, and there's a lot of greatness to it, that, that points to us how much God loves us, like all the good things of love, and how powerful and passionately that Jesus loves you, like a burning flame that cannot be quenched. And then all the brokenness, and the pain, and the disappointment, and the frustration of love, and romance, and sex, is also a point, a, a point and a sign that this earthly stuff was never meant to ultimately satisfy you. So even the frustration and disappointment is a clue to us that you were made for more. 
You're made for God's unconditional, unswerving, always constant, burning love for you. And so here's my ultimate question for you this morning. Let me talk to two people. If you're married, do you look to your spouse to be your everything? Or do you look to Jesus to be your ultimate satisfaction? Do you look to your spouse to be your everything? Or do you look to Jesus to be your ultimate satisfaction? And secondly and lastly, if you're single, do you look to the dream of marriage to solve all your problems? Or do you continually lay that at Jesus' feet and ask him to meet your needs? Those are the two questions that I think this book, these love poems, ultimately have us ask. I'm going to bring up um, Rachel, my wife now, and um, here's why we're doing this. Well, Rachel will share. Um, Rachel, what? (laughs) You guys are seeing this live on the spot here. I'm just going to let you start talking. How about that? Thank you. Yeah, so as Mark and I were kind of talking about this message and uh, where it might hit differently for different people here, I just wanted to speak candidly from my background and the understanding of marriage that I grew up with. So uh, like Mark mentioned, that book, The Meaning of Marriage by Tim Keller, Mark and I read that when we were going through premarital counseling. And for me... When Tim Keller starts painting this picture from the Bible that tells me that marriage is supposed to be something like profound and divine and it points to your relationship with God, that was hugely revelatory for me. Mark was like, oh, I grew up knowing that. He's much smarter than me. (laughs) It was when I was 27. That was the very first time that I heard that marriage is about more than marriage. And if I'm honest, it was a huge weight off of my shoulders because although I grew up going to church, the louder communication to me of what marriage was, was was what culture told me. So it was, um, while emotions are high and while you feel in love, you stay married. And when those wear off, which they inevitably are going to, you peace out and you're done because that's what I saw happen with my parents. And that was my dad's view of marriage. And so I was silently carrying that into our preparation for marriage, just thinking, okay, maybe it's only gonna be a matter of time. And that is a scary, fearful, hopeless place to be in, if you've been there. So when I got hold of this, which is why Mark said earlier, like, this view of marriage will change how you view marriage, love, relationship, singleness, all of it. Because when I got (laughs) that, no, 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 our marriage, and you can come a little bit closer to me if you want. (laughs) The more I talk, the further you're getting away. (laughs) All my fears are coming back. Um, No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) When we started to see, when I started to see, no, no, marriage was designed to be something so much bigger. Marriage was designed so that when Mark and I are taking our kids on a walk and the way that our neighbors observe us interacting, they're like, hmm, they seem to love each other differently. I wonder why. Or that our kids grow up and be like, oh, I can see mom and dad work through struggles and difficulties. I wonder why. There should be this wondering of what kind of love is really in between them. Trust me, it's not just ours. The assignment for our marriage, for marriage, as followers of Jesus, is to point 
to this love that God has for each of us. And if I can just break it down real practically, if I was to be like, oh, Mark only has 10 times that he can mess up, so to speak, big, big boo-boos, and then I'm done. What does that testify about God's love for me? I'm not on a short leash where I have 10 strikes and then I'm out. If we can view our spouses as God sees them, if these marriages can be a testimony that we have a God that no matter how many times we mess up, isn't going to walk out on us, do you understand what a profound witness that can be to the world around us? That there really is a devoted love out there that's not going to give up on you no matter how broken or faulty you are. This is the assignment of marriage. And I don't mean that to be like, oh, this big heavy thing to carry. No, it's actually this huge freeing blessing to carry. Because it's no longer about our own strengths keeping us going. It's no longer about us keeping one another happy in our day-to-day -day needs. All of those things matter. And yes, we shouldn't be messing up the same amount that we were when we first got married. We should be growing, right, and maturing. But it's about something so much more. And so I just wanted to speak to you honestly as somebody who grew up with a larger understanding of a cultural influence of marriage and seeing a broken marriage and how that had warped my own view of marriage because we all carry things into how we view these things. We don't usually talk about it. We want to make space for that this morning. So I hope that you leave encouraged by these words. That this covenant relationship, if you're in a marriage, this is the only covenant relationship that we are in, that God's given us on earth. And that is to mirror something so much bigger, which is his unending, sin-covering love for us. And so I just wanted to pray into all of this, acknowledging that there's a lot of brokenness in different, different situations that people are in this morning. So just invite you to bow your heads as we pray. And if you want to, if you're comfortable, just opening your hands as a, a physical posture of openness to God this morning. God, I have a sense that there are people in here with wedding rings on who haven't spoken it out loud, but in their minds they've already resigned to the fact that it's over. They are hopeless and disappointed beyond belief. And there's hurt after hurt. And they don't see any hope for their marriage. We pray for your healing touch of hope to minister to those couples right now. God wants to remind you that he is the master redeemer and nothing is too far gone for him. Nothing. God, thank you that you haven't given up on us. Thank you that despite the mistakes that we make again and again and the way that we grieve your heart, the way that we miss the mark, your love is so passionate for us. Would you help us to love our spouses that way? Bring gentleness to our hearts. Bring forgiveness. We're asking for your hope. God, would you lift our heads this morning? For those who have bought into the lie that they have to be feeling this passionate love all the time in order to stay faithful to their spouse. Would you be gently weeding that out, replacing it with a deep covenant love? Help us, God, when we look at the cross to be reminded of how you have pursued us in our darkest days and you haven't given up on us and you've loved us when we've been flawed and wounded before you. Help us to love the other that way as well. I pray over the 
people who have been divorced, who come from broken homes, and like me, your biggest imprint of marriage was one of hurt. It's not over. It's not too late. And it's not too late for a fresh start, for new hope, for you to see redemption in that area of your life, for you to see healing in that part of your story. It is not too late. God loves bringing beauty out of really broken things. For the singles here, I pray a special blessing over you that your fidelity to Jesus would be strengthened, that your coworkers and your family and your neighbors would look at your fidelity to Jesus and be like, wow, what is that love? I want that love. They're not looking to the right or the left to be filled with all these other things that culture says they're lacking. They're looking to God. What is that kind of love? Help our singleness and help our marriages to point to this kind of love that you died on the cross to display for all of us. We ask that this morning, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You know, it, God kind of has a funny way of always lining things up so much better than what we plan. And so this Sunday is the first Sunday of November. Um, if you're new to the bridge, we have a tradition of taking corporate communion um, the first Sunday of each month. And what's fascinating to me is that historically, since the advent of the church, communion, um, and it's under your chair, the bread and the cup have actually always been the ultimate sign and symbol of Jesus' love for you. And so what a better Sunday. There isn't a better Sunday to take communion than on this very topic. Um, to kind of just help you out, there's two tabs. The first tab will get to the wafer, the second tab to the cup. You know, even as, as Rachel was praying there, I think the ultimate expression of love is dying for someone. And when it comes down to it, love is, is a verb, it's action, it's not just a noun. Love is far more than feeling, though it does include feelings. And Jesus, with action, died for you and I on the cross, even when it didn't feel good. And so if you're here and you're single or you're divorced, let communion this morning be a reminder that his love is stronger than death. And if you're married, let the cup and the bread be a model for your marriage that love is action and it's sacrifice. And so let me read these words out of Matthew 26. While they were eating Jesus, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said this, take and eat. This is my body. Let us eat the bread together. And then continuing, he said, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let us drink together. So I'm going to invite the prayer team up now you need prayer for anything, they're available here at the front. And as we sing these two songs, I just want to encourage you, sing to the ultimate lover of your soul who loves to hear your voice.